Wunderbar. One can only assume the same will be true of Rise of Skywalker, Scott. Have it. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, episode 9, Rise of Skywalker, I'd said in our last Jedi review that I hope we'll look back in a few years and say that that was the permission slip given to every director and production team that follows to do something completely different to the established Lucas-based Star Wars films. I'm not holding my breath, though. I would like to say now that I called it. Uh, yes. Rise of Skywalker... <laughs> <laughs> Rise of Skywalker sees J.J. Abrams and Cole back for directing and now writing duties, although how many of the ideas, and therefore blame for this film, comes from him and how much from the deranged, tightening Disney overlords is open for discussion. I suppose a plot recap is in order for the seven or eight people who haven't seen it. I'll get to it, I promise, but when the very first thing uh, this film does in the title crawl is reference a tie-in promotional event that happened in the Fortnite video game, which I guess is now canonically in the Star Wars universe, it's very very difficult not to get onto a tangent about what precisely the hell is going on with this franchise. And I, I, not to swear at a uh, <laughs> podcast we're trying to keep relatively clean. Oh, I'm, I'm right behind this. Go on, Fortnite! I had to re- rewrite several sections of this to remove expletives. Uh, yes, even when that event is ultimately of no consequence, but I can't decide if that makes it worse or better. Uh, anyway, Ian McDermott's Emperor Palpatine is back because why not? And he's hiding a fleet of infinite Star Destroyers, <laughs> each with Death Star lasers on board because why not? Uh, having survived death from episodes in episode 6 for some reason that's apparently not all that important to delve into. He's holed up on the, the lost Sith planet of Exima or something as is trying to join up with Kylo Ren and his borderline incompetent First Order goons. And actually, you know what? If you want a full recap, go to Wikipedia. One of the critical problems with this film is that it stuffs at least a film and a half's worth of plot into its running time. But even so, it's just a lot of running about with no meaning. Uh, in broad, in broad strokes, Ray and the remnants of the Rebel Force are trying to take, uh, find a Sith navigational MacGuffin to get to that their lost planet and take out the Emperor and his fleet, and Ren and his goons are trying to stop them and or bring them before Palpatine for judgement. Cue the usual Star Wars dog and pony show. Now, I'm not a fan of, well, Star Wars as a whole anymore, but the one interesting, if I'd argue not completely successful thing that The Last Jedi does, was to look inside Abrams' patented mystery box, dig out a few of them, look at them and say that ultimately there could be no truly satisfying answer to this, because if there was, it would need to be so integral to a character's personality or arc that they could not be in that box to start with. If, for example, Ray's parentage really meant something, we'd need to know that from the outset for it to be anything more than a superficial revelation. To which Rise of Skywalker says, Oh, Phil Lord, no, and start stuffing things back into that box, only to immediately pull them back out again with different answers, which is all about amateur ever. And while this and a dozen other plot strands that are picked up and either instantly resolved or discarded, uh, for example, Oscar Isaac's love interest or the entirety of the Knights of Ren, are all rushed past quickly enough that Rise of Skywalker does a decent impersonation of a reasonably enjoyable Star Wars outing, assuming you still like this sort of thing, it can stand up to no scrutiny whatsoever. Yes, now, here's the problem. Yeah. Now, given that this is a film based on laser space wizards, <laughs> I'm not the sort to get all that upset about plot holes. There's a f- very few that couldn't ultimately be waved away by saying that a wizard did it, but what does annoy me about this... <laughs> What does annoy me about this is that Disney were so hungry to start recouping the franchise purchase price that they didn't sketch out even the barest coherent story or character arc for these poor bastards saddled with acting in it or writing and directing it, which leaves us with this cobbled together closer for a trilogy in name only that appears primarily concerned with an excuse to make new Palpatine action figures and to continue strip mining the franchise's past, which is ironic given that the closest thing I can think of for a linking theme for the new trilogy is that it's about letting go of the past and not letting it define you where the, f- the films themselves continue to be wholly defined by that original trilogy. It's because they're copies of them, more or less. And it's not served anyone well, and it's hard to see this as anything. Uh, say anything in the modern trilogy is anything other than the quest for dollars, which is perhaps always the case in the studio tentpole game, but even when Lucas was disastering his way through the prequels, there was at least an obvious point to them, told through a clear character arc, and there's nothing like that in these two films. They're well made, they've got likeable performances, and there's enough gloss to obfuscate most of this, but there's just no point to them. While the likes of Daisy Ridley, Oscar Isaacs and John Boyega bring enough charisma with their performances to be likeable enough and engaging enough to bluster their way through this, in the, what, seven hours following these people around? What have we actually learned about any of these characters or their motivations or their past or anything to do with them to really care about any of them? Look, there's a lot to talk about. 
if not specifically about the Rise of Skywalker, but more about Disney's general handling of Star Wars and what's happening going forward. See also a recent uh, Trends of the Decade episode. So I won't monopolise the discussion further, but if you want my verdict on this, it's a bad ending to a middling trilogy, and if I had any great luck, love left for Star Wars, I would find this greatly upsetting. As I don't, <laughs> it's just mildly irritating and entirely forgettable. Drew, speak priest! <laughs> yeah, um, the first thing I want to mention is to, in response to Scott's points is, you mentioned about Disney seeming like hell bent on getting their money back as soon as possible. Mm. And that honestly baffles me because it's the same company that owns Marvel who have done this incredible pre-planned thing that is yeah. netting yeah. them an incredibly cohesive, well-produced universe. Yeah, I wanted to make that point of How <coughs> is this thing possible? That Marvel are doing better than other people is taking existing IP and actually developing it in a respectful way, which clearly Disney are not doing with Star yeah. Wars. Yeah, I don't understand how it can be under the um, auspices of the same company. It's so short-sighted. Yeah. Second thing is that when I came out of this, I thought, oh, well, some things I liked, some things I didn't like. I found that reasonably enjoyable. Mm-hmm. If I'd stopped there, I might have been okay. But yeah. as you both know, I am entirely <laughs> incapable of doing that, entirely incapable of not thinking about things, and the more you think about it, the more it falls apart to the point now I hate this f- film, it's awful. <laughs> it's, I mean, I really, honestly, really, really want to not care, but I do. <laughs> I care deeply, uh, and it bothers me. It's... I mean, from the get-go, quite apart from the Fortnite thing, which you'd warned me about, Scott, I hadn't heard that beforehand, but you'd told me about that, and like, so I was already kind of angry about the film before I even got to the opening crawl. Yeah. It's like, from the get-go, they're basically looking at The Last Jedi, which I still think is the best Star Wars film since Empire, mm-hmm. and they went, they basically well, Ryan Johnson, screw you, and retconning everything. Like, anything happened in that film? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So they've got therefore like basically half a film's crammed in somewhere of them undoing everything that was done there, because for some reason they've been making this up as they go along. Yeah. Mm. It makes no sense. I do not understand that. Um, yeah. Again, though, but that's the thing about that's the baffling thing about them not playing the long game, Drew, is that this is something they paid four billion dollars for. They're building theme parks around, and the stuff that's actually informing it from a story point of view, as you've just pointed out, they are making up as they go along. Yeah, yeah. How can you invest that much money in anything and not <laughs> plan it? Yeah. How can you, like, at least? Um, a series of bullet points would be enough. Yeah, a yeah. basic story arc of like where you want to go and your main um, character beats and stuff, yeah. and then like maybe certain like people respond to things in the Force Awakens more than others. Not okay, but we hammer more on that, pull back in other things, but at least have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's just, it's such a stupid, stupid, stupid film. The thing that frustrates me is this conversation and this sort of emotional um, subplot people are trying to build around this film as. Like you've just said, Drew, about it's like to Ryan Johnson. It's hard to it's hard to see it as any other way because that's probably what it feels like. But of course it's not. It's got, Disney don't hate Ryan Johnson. They're not saying you to Ryan Johnson. They they gave Ryan Johnson free reign. As far as we're aware, JJ still... Abrams is clearly is. Well, I, no, again, JJ Abrams has been done. What so JJ Abrams, let's be clear. I've been saying this for years. Is a total hack. He's a, he's maybe a step above Chris Columbus, I and that's about Abr- it. I think JJ Abrams can do action really well. What he can do is write, and he's one yeah. of the seven credited screenwriters on this, but yeah. on the principal one. We, they keep trying to sell us JJ Abrams as the new Spielberg, and it ain't happening because he's no, not. He's Stop not pretending Spielberg. that he is. And there also, are, Spielberg isn't, uh, doesn't uh, think he should yeah. write. He lets other people who are better at writing do the writing for him. Yeah, exactly. The man's a hack. And he's. Uh, this is not. You from him to Ryan Johnson either. He doesn't care. Doesn't he have just said, oh, okay, there was a lot of backlash to stuff in The Last Jedi, so we're going to ask you to do this again because people were happy with the first one and here's a list of stuff that we need to happen and he's ticked off the list as he's gone along. And honestly, that's the discussion needs to be about how Disney are treating this IP that they've paid so much money for and they're building theme parks around that they're allowing it to be made up by people as they yeah. go along. It is frankly insane. And again, we've said it before, Marvel are doing this stuff so much better than anyone else. They are showing that there is a way it can be done and the audiences will come back to see 27 films in a row, (laughs) whatever the tally is at this point, with no, obviously, fluctuations from film to film, but no discernible sort of downturn anywhere anywhere through there that could be perceived as a fan backlash to any of the films. And Disney, within the space of three... 
have managed to go all round the houses, make a complete hash of it, and upset just about everybody at some point. And yeah, we we discussed this before, didn't we, Drew? Uh, in fact, did we discuss it in the the trends podcast? Did we talk about Last Jedi then? And the fact Definitely that very recently I've talked. Yeah, about and the fact that I'd gone back and revisited it, and I actually agree with you now, Drew, that I think it is the best one since Empire. I th- I think I just think people are going to look back on this in ten years and think, oh wow, yeah, that was a bit crazy, wasn't it? Um, allowing bizarre, sad little factions of internet trolls to dictate what happens to a four billion dollar franchise. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool story, Disney. You 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 deserve what you get, frankly. Um, yeah, just just mental, man. I've this is the first time that a Star Wars film has hit the cinema, and I've just been like, eh. I've always at least mustered some sort of enthusiasm to go and try and see them if I can at the cinema, and I just genuinely don't care about this one. Mm, I genuinely it's- don't care. It's frustrating because there are actually really good bits in it. Um, mm. But before I go on either end, I, I have a lot to say about this film. Um, but can we assume from this point onwards, or allow us to, to go to spoiler territory? Um, this gives me an opportunity to break out the um, the spoiler klaxon again. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, so from this point onwards, if you've not seen Star Wars yet and don't want to hear us discuss it, skip to the end. This is the last film we're covering in this episode. Um, otherwise, stick around. Um, it's got us good enough to drop chapter markers in. So, yeah. Um, right. Of all the because the really honestly, there are good things in here. Right. The acting of a lot of the principals actually really good. Um, there's like really good chemistry between Oscar Isaac and John Boyega, which is um, mm-hmm. weird given they've barely been on screen together in the other two episodes. So it's like, well, what are you look like what you were missing. Um, yeah. And I actually, I knew there was meant to be uh, this. Like, so many people were talking so much about it because the people of the world already it's about like the gay kiss. And I was like, maybe slightly persuaded by. Uh, a red letter media thing for The Force Awakens, but I actually assumed it was going to be Finn and um Oh, you you naive fellow. Yeah. You naive chap. Imagine it being something actually that couldn't be cut out of markets where that would be a yeah. <laughs> problematic. Finn and Poe, because they're really, really in love with each other for the whole film. It's really yeah. clear. Um and it's like, oh no, there's like one barely in focus peck on the lips um, for half a second at the end of the film I was like that's just offensive yeah. that's genuinely offensive that that's, that's what I was, especially given like oh, those looked like they were a couple and there's this mystery through the film of which presumably got lost in the terrible editing or the fact that they're trying to cram so much into his home and it never stops uh, at one point Finn says I've got something to tell you for most of the film, it's like, I'm in love with Poe. No, it's not. It's nothing, because they forget to actually do that, because yeah. well done, J.J. Evans, you've made a hash of putting it in it. There are two really, really big problems I have with this film, um, more than any others. And I now do look at my notes because I forgot what the other one was. <laughs> so apparently it can't be that big. Um, one, it's gash. Two, <laughs> it's gash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, one it sort of ties in with the undoing of the Last Jedi too. But like the Star Wars universe is is really unimaginative and small and small minded, right? It's all got the same stuff in it all the time, and it's this huge universe. They should be able to do something, but the in the Last Jedi they set up the fact that Ray's parents, you know, they weren't special. I thought, great, that's really good because we've already done the story arc of the person who was the child of the really important person. Mm. That's what the original trilogy was about. And like the second film said, uh, ah, no, it's not important. Really great because there was all the theories about being Obi Wan Kenobi's child and everything. And yeah. like, then it gets like, oh no, she's Palpatine's granddaughter. F- off. I, I just don't stop f- off. Like, well, no, it, that's not interesting. You've done it before. It's really not just, it doesn't make a lick of sense. And you've already established in your other films that Jedi are meant to be celibate. So in which case, given there were tens of thousands of Jedi, they must be quite plentiful across the galaxy, people that are like sensitive to the Force. You didn't need to do that. Hmm. Uh, what annoyed me most about Ray Palpatine is, as I say, if, if her being a Palpatine was in any way informed her character, 
we'd have needed to have known that long before at then. The she yes. would have needed to yeah. have known that. Otherwise, it's just something that's thrown at the last minute and go, oh, you're a Palpatine. Oh, well, that doesn't really mean anything to me. I'm still going to fight you because I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it does make any sense. Yeah. Um, and the other big thing, this is not like my biggest problem with it, and compared to the prequels, what this new trilogy have done is pulled back a lot on the, like, a thousand lightsaber battles and thousands with a thousand lightsabers and attacking yeah. the clones at one point. And that's good. It's shown a bit more restraint. So the, that's one of the good points of this new trilogy. Any lightsaber battle is meaningful. You know, they're, they're actually interspersed mm. and they generally have character beats in them too. I mean, that's great. What they've done in this film, though, is... Because even in the prequels, right, the Force was basically a thing that, kind of, it's mystical energy, whatever, and Jedi could use it, but at the most point, it gave you an edge. That's all it did, right? Maybe made you a bit faster, better reactions, or if you wanted to use it for evil, like Palpatine, you can influence people, right? Or, or fire lightning at their face, to be fair. <laughs> but still, that was with, like, like right person to person. Ass. Person to person, though, right, Scott? <laughs> it was like, so, like, the Force basically gave you an edge. In this film, the Force has become universe-changing magic, and it's appalling. <laughs> I'm not even joking, it's like suddenly like one person can electrocute like 10,000 ships or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm talking of, of the, the other ships. But it's pleasing it's, the fanboys. Remember the fanboys who were really upset about the force projection thing in The Last Jedi? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which it doubles down on in this, actually. It's oh, cool. Stronger. Yeah. Um, no, it's like the, the Emperor's got this, it's like presumably come from the Force or something, but the Emperor, or the clone of the Emperor, I don't think he... So meant not to meant to have died in Return of the Jedi, it's a clone. And actually, that I'm fine with, apart from the books that have covered Emperor's clones loads of times, the original Star Wars, within 20 minutes, is talking about clones. That has always been there. That is actually fine. Hmm. And other things, it might seem really stupid. No, there are entire films about clones. They knew that that was in Star Wars. The first, there was like... I fought with your father in his Clone Wars. You know, that was always a thing. So that's okay. But apparently he's just created... Because everything in this... They just have to turn it up to, like, 20, basically. Everything's too much. They've got, like, 10... I think they mentioned 10,000 ships or something. Or, no. Actually, it must be more, because Richard E. Grant's character says we're going to increase our power 10,000-fold. Yeah. But, yeah, how how did they build those? Well, that was that was explained away. You see, because the emperor emperor has those uh, that little force of troglodytes it seemed to be uh, that were yeah. worshipping him. So I assume that once they finish worshipping him, they just go off to the shipyards and build some really high tech ships with the uh, Death Star cannons on yeah, them because got but, a contract with Foxconn. Yeah. But but they get money, <laughs> the money and the resources and the staff in there to build this, despite the fact there are only two things in entire existence that will let you get there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they've not thought of this too. See, one thing that didn't happen with this film was thinking. Yes. Any way whatsoever. Yeah, so you're making the um, mistake of thinking too much, Drew. Yeah, but you know I can't not do that. I know. Um, but then. Don't do it to yourself. They just come in and then they seem to forget which film they're in. They suddenly think they're in Nicolas Cage's National Treasure when they find things by a special knife with a slidey out bit. <laughs> it's offensively is that, stupid. Is that what happens in National Treasure? I, I had this conversation yeah. with someone the other day that I think, because you know growing up where you have just like a photographic memory for everything that happens in every film, <laughs> I think National Treasure was the first film that I saw at a cinema where I have got literally no recollection of a damn thing that happens <laughs> in it. I don't remember. I remember like one of them had... Uh, something hidden in somebody's desk that Queen yeah. Victoria gave one person and in the second National Treasure film they need a photograph of something and apparently nobody has a camera phone and the best way they can think to do it is to speed through a traffic light in London and hold it up to the traffic camera then hack into London's traffic <laughs> camera database to get the photograph they took of the thing they were holding up to the windscreen at the time while they were being chased that and I hate that I remember vague, that <laughs> that rings a vague bell and when I say rings a vague bell did it have the Liberty Bell in it as well? <laughs> It did, didn't it? Didn't one, one of them have the Liberty think, Bell in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah so I do the, remember something. Sorry. There is a, there Rise is of like Skywalker. A, <laughs> one, of, one of many MacGuffins in this film is a knife to let them know where the other MacGuffin they need to get is hidden. So they need a MacGuffin to get a MacGuffin. Uh -huh. And it's basically like something out of National Treasure or something like that. that how, how do you use a knife to navigate in space? 
You don't. What you do is apparently in the past, because this knife is ancient, and knew that the Death Star would la- crash land on a planet, despite the fact the Death Star was destroyed, uh-huh. crash land on a planet and be in exactly the right shape so that you could ins- uh, inscribe the edge of the blade with the shape of the the crash Death Star, and then pull a wee bit out of the blade that will show you exactly where in the crash Death Star the thing, you're, the MacGuffin you're looking for is hidden. I have foreseen it. It's unbelievably <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Listen, like, I have film, a gummy <laughs> sat nav. <laughs> the film is is so got so much in it, and it basically never, <laughs> ever, ever stops, and it's relying on you. And it never stopping, so you never ever think. And my brain works more quickly than that. So even while I was watching it, it's um, I'm getting offended by how stupid this is. But uh, yeah, take it, the second exit. Okay. <laughs> 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 Your faith in Google Maps is yours. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. Sorry. <laughs> so, really so I always thought it was weird that Tom Tom sounded very like Tonton. <laughs> oh Christ, that's terse. Thank you. Somehow you've managed to lower it. I assume you mean tenuous, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then like there's two really clear points in this film where you could kill off major characters that would be meaningful, and they do neither. But. Um, but C-3PO is like going to, ah, I'm going to sacrifice myself with my friends that I've known for like three minutes but okay, but then they undo it because he's a robot so they give him a backup mm. Mm. Well they've got and toys then, to think about yeah. There's a scene where Ray thinks she's killed Chewbacca and that's the one that bothers me more um, Yeah, I've heard about this Because that's that's actually would have been an incredibly important character moment especially if mm-hmm. you're buying into the whole she's the granddaughter of the most evil person that's ever lived basically It's like She's got power she doesn't really understand, can't control, that she's therefore dangerous mm. and potentially evil. That's actually really interesting. If she inadvertently kills someone with, like, not knowing what she's doing, um, you know, they could have done... Uh, no, 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 it was, it was a basically a, um, a shell game and he was in a different ship all along. Mm. Psych. Um, and presumably they had to keep him alive just so that he could cry at the end and also so that Maz Kanada, the... Orange character who <laughs> was definitely in the other films, definitely. Yeah. Um, can it's it's so offensive. This I kind of forgot that I was watching it with my niece at the time, um, so <laughs> I don't think she heard me swear because the film's incredibly loud. So it's just as well because Maz can add it. Turns up, walks up to Chewbacca in the middle of a forest, hands him the medal that he conspicuously didn't get in A New Hope, and said, mm. "Here, this is for you." And it's a f- off really loudly in the middle of the cinema. I couldn't help myself. Uh, so, well, the tube was all right, but presumably we did hundreds of other people die. Maybe. Cool, but tube was all right. Yeah. Yeah. We can all be happy then. We can keep selling um, the toys. Yeah, I mean, I just to go. This honestly, when I came out, I'd quite enjoyed it, and then I just thought about it, and the whole thing fell apart because everything about this film was wrong. Well, it means there's no stakes, isn't it? If they demonstrate that they're literally unwilling to end any character, then what's the point? Yeah, I'm amazed totally. they bothered with Han Solo to start with, to be honest. Yeah, but that's like as Harrison Ford wanted out, although he's actually well, yeah. back in this film. How they persuade him to do that, I have no idea. It's a massive oh, no, of money. Uh, wait, well, wait a minute, as like a force ghost or something? Mm, that's a memory. Oh, right, okay. Um, <sighs> but yeah, it's the only person of import, depending whether you think Palpatine's dead or not, because, well, clones, so maybe not. <laughs> We've already demonstrated that he probably isn't, surely, yeah. if he's back in this one. Um, I thought he was pretty comprehensive. Up at the end of <laughs> the, <laughs> the end of Return of the Jedi, well, they kill off Adam Driver's character because he sacrifices himself, and that's maybe the one bit of the film I actually kind of liked. Mm. Is he's another person? As much as he was like kind of Darth Emo, I quite like Adam Driver. I know he's a, a special effect Scott yeah. likes most of the time. <laughs> um, I quite like him in that, so that was okay. And then they kill off. Princess Leia, but since the actor's already dead, mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily have a lot of import. Mm. But for everything else, like character wise, they're just it, the film never stops, and they bring in a character whose like arc is re- resolved in almost literally three minutes. Yeah. So it's like this love interest of Paul Dameron who comes in, says, I've got this really important thing I've been saved my whole life for. Also, I hate you, you abandoned us. There's a wee scuffle with some stormtroopers like you know that really um, important thing to me I've saved my whole life to get? 
yeah, here you can have it now because you need it for your plot, bye bye. And then that's that, that character apart from like a brief glimpse at the end. And it's full of stuff like that. Character pops in for half a scene and then goes away again. And there was no time to breathe this entire film. <sighs> it's just, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. I mean, again, it still somehow manages to be entertaining in parts, but it is an absolute honking mess. Mm. I'll end up seeing it at some point, because as we discussed before, uh, when the kids are a bit older, um, I'll let them watch the, the new ones. They're already nagging me about um, The Force Awakens, but I, f- I feel like they're maybe a little bit too too young for some some of this stuff. So inevitably, when they're a bit older, I'll sit and watch this with them, but I don't intend to catch up with it before then. Yeah, it's... it's... I just I really wanted to have stopped even for like ten seconds, just like you know, just breathe, just breathe. Mm. Ten, especially for like a two hour twenty minute film, it's like you know, there's no stopping at all. There's no down moments. Lots of pointless cars. Like, they've added well, there's the horse lady and the helmet lady and Lando because fan service. I guess well, it's actually not so bad on the fan service front. In this. Um, and I've probably a bunch of other cards don't need to be there, except then it, and going back to the whole screw you Ryan Johnson thing, because I do believe it but um, the like the Last Jedi sets up that Rose really loves Finn and she sac- almost sacrificed herself to save him from sacrificing himself and stuff like, I think she's in the background of Acid in this film, maybe possibly for a minute mm. yeah. she, she, so, she shows up and says I can't be in this film bye because the internet hates me, yeah. apparently. <laughs> yeah, it's... I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop now. It's, it's just such a mess. And uh, the thing is... The, you are dedicating an awful lot of time to a film that doesn't deserve it, clearly. I, know, I, I told you I don't want to care, but to do, that's the problem. It's, um, I, get, I, I just get kind of offended by how much they've squandered a property that lots of people genuinely love, right? Because they didn't even have the capacity to sit down and sketch out a basic plots arc for three films. That's offensive. Yeah. And it's just... And kind of there are good things in here. Oscar Isaac and John Boyega and Daisy Ridley sometimes when she's with them. There's a lot of chemistry there. They're really fun. Ian McDermott is so over the top of this film that I was convinced it was somebody doing an Ian McDermott impression, but it isn't. <laughs> um, so that can be quite entertaining. And... Now, there are bits and pieces here of people actually kind of doing like fun things, and there's some good acting in there, just in the the service of absolutely nothing at all. Yeah, right. just to just to chime in on the Twitter's uh, at Blake writes for talking about Rise. Of, if the Force Awakens invited the question where we might we go from here, then the two sequels, nearly a billion dollars of filmmaking budgets later, we finally have an answer: nowhere. <laughs> a vacuous, <laughs> awkwardly built mausoleum to both originality and nostalgia. Uh, yeah, I agree entirely. It's just. My, my major problems with the first two films was always that they didn't seem to be going anywhere. They were all shots to nothing. They were safety shots. And it was leaving an awful lot of, of film to try and put into this one. And it's not managed to do it, to no one's surprise. What a waste of effort. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>